It's your family tree, a mystery. Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip hip hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In cutoff genes. <laughs> Welcome to Cutoff Genes, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I am Julie Dixon Jackson, and I'm a genetic genealogist henceforth known as Jen Genie. I am all by myself in my living room on this lovely Thanksgiving morning. Um, and I wanted to bring you guys the second part of Darren Watson's interview from the last episode of um, season four. And as a special bonus, before we go to Darren, I want to let you guys know um, about, oh, first of all, thank you so much, people who have added new reviews to iTunes, very much appreciate it. Also, um, anyone who is supporting us on the Patreon, and also wanted to let you guys know that I am no longer contracting for that uh, separate private investigator company, which... Uh, is actually pretty cool because now I'm available for just my clients and I, I prefer to work for myself. Anyway, I get to do things the way that I think they should be done. I cost about a third of what uh, a private investigator's company will cost you. So this is exciting. I am about to launch my website We'll let you know about that as soon as it happens. In the meantime, if you need help with your DNA, if it needs to be just analysis, if you want me to check your work or if you want me to take your whole case, reach out to me, Jules Jackson at cutoffjeans.com. And also, if you want to follow me on TikTok, I have a lot of uh, adoptee, NPE, and DNA-related content on there as well as just silly things that I like to do. We all know how silly I like to be. Anyway, uh, let's have a listen to Darren Watson, uh, the adoption reunion coach. And I will come back to give you more information on the other side. I picked up the phone and a woman said, hello, Darren, this is your, your real mother. And it was my birth mother. Wow. Uh, And I just started freaking out. I said, oh, my God, oh, my God, and over and over again. And I started crying, and she did too. And um, her voice sounded familiar to me. Yeah, oh, interesting. In in some way. And we we talked for an hour and a half. Uh, She told me who my birth father was. She told me the circumstances of what happened as to why I was relinquished for adoption. And so we we had a really good conversation. We exchanged um, contact information, addresses, and um, we agreed to stay in touch. And I I was just floored. Yeah. Um, so what after- was the story? Who who was the person that had seen? Um, I guess your information that that knew to reach out to her. It it was Roy Kading. Um, he. He's a an adoptee in Winnipeg. He's retired, and he called and left a message for one of my cousins. And he said, "I'm looking for the youngest of three sisters." Oh, okay. So they took the the information that you already knew her mm-hmm. name. So he knew what name he was looking for. I I didn't know her name. Oh, you uh, didn't. I knew my no. I. I did get identifying information, but I, it's not an actual birth certificate. Okay. Um, so, uh, but he left a message, and it was Thanksgiving weekend in Canada mm-hmm. at that time. So when she they came back to Hannah from uh, another town where her husband's family was, and and her her niece was telling her, you know, there's a a guy named Roy looking for you and he left this phone number and she couldn't figure out who, why, why Roy was calling. And hmm. so on the way back to where they lived, it was a, a two hour drive, I think. And she said, Oh my God, I, I know what it's, it's my son. And um, my their youngest son, uh, my other brother, was driving at the time, and he didn't know about me. So mm. 
my birth mother and had to tell him. And then when they got to back home, she called and we spoke for the first time. So that was a good first connect, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So tell me how things evolved from there. We started uh, writing letters and sending pictures uh, that I think it was that Friday or Saturday I got uh, a letter of envelope with a long handwritten letter and a whole bunch of pictures and uh, descriptions on the back of the pictures who they were who was in the photos and what time frame and stuff like that that's amazing isn't it yeah yeah and I, I just kept looking at the photos all weekend um, at different points it, it's kind of like a, a big adrenaline high yeah I also can really relate to when you said that your mother's voice sounded familiar. I had that sensation, too, the first time I talked to my mother. Okay. Yeah. So we, we would write each other. We talked um, once or twice a week. And we would um, we didn't have email back then, so we would fax each other at work, which is kind of yeah, archaic now. <laughs> but um, as the week progressed I, I started thinking you know I really want to meet meet with her and, and meet my brothers and and so I suggested uh, that you know maybe I should come up there for Christmas and New Year's mm -hmm. and she she was open to the idea she had to talk to the rest of the family about it and I told my parents and they were a little reluctant at first um, but my mom, you know, she, she agreed and accommodated it. So we, we had Christmas a few days early here with our family. And then, uh, I flew up to Calgary on December 21st Okay. and my birth mother picked me up at the airport and we met at the, in, in the lobby and hugged each other for the first time. And it was, it was really amazing because I, I grew up watching a lot of talk shows that sometimes it would have reunions with a birth mother and an right. adoptee. And I wanted to have that experience with her. Yeah. And we, we stayed at a hotel with adjoining rooms that night in Calgary. And then uh, just to get to know each other. And then the next day we, we drove back to the town where they lived. And, and I was really scared about the at one point um meeting my brothers and uh, i curled up kind of in a ball and the, she was driving and i put my head on her lap and i was crying oh really and grieving and i don't know how long that lasted but afterwards i felt some relief and a lot of the nervousness went away and so we got to the house and I met my brothers and her husband and um, my brothers were really excited to meet and I think her husband was a bit apprehensive, a little bit nervous. Yeah. And, and I, now I understand where he was coming from um, because my birth mother and I had developed a strong connection over the couple of months that was, since we had found each other and I think she had spent a lot of her time and energy focused on me and, and not the family. Sure. So that, that makes sense. Uh, usually, I I tell people in in adoption that you know you you might be wanted, but you're also a dis a disruption to the existing existing family. So, so far so good, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, there there were there was some tension during the visit initially and uh, when things would get tense I would go to the spare room at the end of the hall where I, where I was staying and I would journal or meditate or call a friend and just kind of try to get centered again and and give other people space and in the city where they lived uh, we had mutual friends that my my parents knew from Peace River from years ago and uh, they they were away for holidays, but they gave me a spare key where I could go if if needed oh, for that's some nice. time out. Yeah. So I 
I did go there for a couple of nights okay. and and that was that was helpful. Yeah, I bet. I bet. All right. So, that was in 1995, 6. Yes, 95, 90 big year of 96. Okay. And have things changed? Yes. <laughs> they, they changed. <laughs> Let's get to that. They, or I get to it anyway you see fit. Okay. Um well, that summer we we talked about going to meeting in British Columbia to, to go meet my grandparents because they lived in the Okanagan Valley. And I asked my birth mother to, you know, try to make some plans. And it took almost two weeks and I still had not heard anything back. And so I decided, okay, I, I journaled and prayed about it. And the message was to go ahead and make your plan. So I, I did book my flights and after I did that, I, I told my birth mother, and she was not too happy about that. And it it just felt devastating, because in my mind, I thought two weeks, twelve days to, you know, have a ten minute conversation about booking um, vacation. I, that's how I perceived it. But wait, go back. She what was she not happy about? That that I booked the the flight without oh. talking to her first. Oh, okay. Um, because in my mind, I thought, you know, if you've got almost two weeks to, to decide and you haven't, yeah. you know, something is wrong, but, um, I did end up my, my connecting flight to British Columbia was through Calgary. And I, I did tell her that I, I was kind of nervous about telling her I, I had a layover in Calgary because I, I didn't want to lie to her, but, um, it ended up she and her husband decided to come up and see me during my layover. Okay. And so I flew up to Calgary and I, I was going through customs and I come around the corner and I cut off a whole bunch of people because I wanted to get through customs quickly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I got some dirty looks uh, from others. But uh, so we, we had a picnic at a local park and, um, it was kind of surreal to see her again. Uh, it was a nice short visit, but it, a, a lot of the tension was, was not there that had been during the, the two weeks Sure. when we first met. So we had, we had a short visit and then uh, that December, she and her husband came down to visit us in Texas and meet my family and, and that went it was kind of up and down she and she, her husband and i had um some tension and he he and i went out for breakfast one morning and talked about things and i listened to his point of view and his experience in the whole reunion thing and and i felt a lot of empathy for him because it's so overwhelming for him sure. as well and after that we kind of settle our differences and um they went back to Canada before Christmas and things I thought were were doing fairly well and sometimes um there were there would be a bump on the road between my birth mother and I. Um we would take some months off from talking or just really things that I didn't think were that big of a deal that she might be upset about or vice versa. Hmm. And I, I, after our first reunion, I, I started going back to therapy. I found a new therapist a few months later and um, he was not trained in adoption issues, but he was very good at helping me process feelings and, and look at things differently. Sure. And, and that was helpful. And unfortunately, my birth mother would not go to therapy because she said it was just too painful. And mm. I think in the long run, that that had a big uh, detriment to to our long term relationship. Right. So um, she, you said she was 15 when she had you? 16. 16. She just barely. Yeah, she turned 16 a few weeks before. Okay probably a lot of trauma that she didn't feel comfortable accessing yeah is that what you think yeah i i think that's that's a fair statement yeah. um she 
when I was relinquished, she put on the adoption papers that she wanted me to know that I was adopted. Mm -hmm. Um, That was her desire. She didn't have control over that, but my parents always told me I was adopted. Mm -hmm. And for various reasons, she and her husband decided not to tell my brothers that about me. Right. And so there were, they didn't have any uh, expectation or prior knowledge of, of me until I found them. They were 19 and 21 each, mm-hmm. uh, and I was 25. So I, I, I wish he had told them, but, you know, there's nothing that can be done about that. And did um, her husband know? He knew, yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um she she said she didn't want to hurt his feelings and that's why she didn't want to talk about it but i think she was protecting protecting herself as well sure so uh, i got engaged in, to my my now wife in 2002 or pardon me 2001 and our wedding was in 2002 in march and uh, she and her husband came down to to our wedding with my son and uh, I thought things were going really well and after that I I don't know what changed but she would send me some weird angry letters and at some point she would uh, she would want to break things off and say I give you up to God and and say goodbye and I would um, I would think you know what is going on here and So I'd write back and try to fix things between us. And I think over the 20 years of our reunion, she probably rejected me about six times. And um, just... That's a lot to deal with. Yeah. In hindsight, it was. And I had written over the years, I'd written my birth father a couple of times, and so had she, but he never responded to me. And in the winter of 2009, I just decided I was going to, one day, one day I wanted to contact my brothers. And I found... Your paternal three, brothers? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I had three paternal brothers, and I looked on Facebook, and I picked one of them to contact. I don't know why. But I sent him a friend request, and he wrote back and asked how we knew each other. So I got nervous, but I explained in a message who my birth mother was and that her father hooked up with her, and um, I I was adopted. And so my brother Aaron, he accepted my friend request, and a couple days later he, he said, well, you know, there's some weird things that have happened in this family and this isn't beyond the reality of possibility. Sure. So we, we started communicating on Facebook and then a couple of years later, uh, I was in Calgary or in Red Deer, Alberta, which is between Edmonton and Calgary. And I met him and his wife at the time and we had, a, we met and then I, I drove him back to the family farm and uh, we spent three hours together and, it was really amazing because I, I found someone that thinks like me. Yeah. And like, uh, we went to get some food in a fast food drive through and he said, so how do you want to do this? Do you want to buy the food and I get the gas or vice versa? And I'm like, Oh my God, that's how I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. And, yeah. <laughs> and it, like, this is so, so cool. Yeah. And, and then we, we stopped in the town where, a real small town where they live, um, close to the farm. And we went to the small general store that they had. And as I came out of the restroom, I started walking towards the car. And I, I just felt some grief hit me inside. And I oh. thought, oh, no. So we opened the car doors. And I, I sat with, I knelt beside the driver's seat. And I said, I need a minute and I just started crying and Aaron said you know it's okay I don't know what you're going through but 
you know, it's all right. He sounds amazing. Yeah. He is, he has a lot of compassion. And after a couple minutes, I, I let the grief go through me and, and uh, we were okay. And drove back to the farm and I said goodbye to him. And it was a really amazing experience to meet him. Yeah. And, then uh, a few years back in 2015, I was in Canada. It was my my son's uh, 25th birthday, so I uh, I went up there for his birthday, and then um, I met with Aaron, and then his mother wanted to meet me. So I I, I was nervous, but I said okay. So I I went to her house. She was in the process of moving and I, I met her and her sister and her sister was married to my paternal uncle. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, Aaron's mom and my other, their, their mom was divorced from my birth father. Okay. And so she showed me, we went out for dinner and she showed me a whole bunch of pictures and it was, it was a really nice visit, and she told me some of the things that happened in the family that um, I, I felt a lot of empathy for her and my brothers and also some survivor's guilt because she, mm. my birth father, was not a good person. Right. A couple of days later, I got a message that my uncle wanted to meet me, and uh, so I was driving to their house, uh, and I was about a quarter mile of, away from the house around the corner. And I, I just felt this huge amount of fear and grief hit me. And yeah. so I pulled over in my rental car and I lay back, played some music and just tried to calm down. And I sat up and I, across the street, there were some female Mormon missionaries walking on the sidewalk. And my, my wife used to be in the Mormon church mm-hmm. and so I took that as a sign that things were going to be okay. Mm-hmm. So I, I pulled up to the, my aunt and uncle's house and um, my aunt came out and greeted me and I was, I was really nervous. And then my uncle came in and I, he gave me a hug and uh, we talked for about an hour and then they took me for dinner and it was a really nice visit. And I've seen them a few times uh, since then. Well, that's lovely. And, uh, yeah. So and then you do also have on... a connection to both sides, which is, I think, so important. At least yeah. to have had in your life. Yeah. 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 And I, on that trip, I also met my other brother and his wife and um, three ne- nieces and nephews as well. And it was, it was really a really wonderful trip. That's great. And... Um, and that was back in the summer of 2015. And okay. So in October 9th rolled around, it was the 20 year reunion of my, since I met my birth mother on the phone and I, I messaged her and said happy 20 year reunion. And we, we weren't communicating that much. And she wrote back later that night and I didn't read the message till the next morning. and. She, she seemed to be upset I didn't contact her on that trip. Oh. Um, I was in Canada. And then she had talked about, she wrote about, uh, she had wanted to tell me to remove the pictures of my uh, reunion with my fraternal family on my Facebook page because I used their last name. And then she ended the message with, you should really think about other people's feelings. Oh, and and that was a Saturday morning. And in the past, I, I used to, you know, she would do kind of gaslight me and say things like that. I would, I would respond immediately. But this time, I just, I didn't reply. I just, I told my wife what the message was, and I, I called a friend of mine who's an adoptee and talked to him. And so I waited till Monday to reply to her, and I said, you know what, I'm. 45 years old, I'm not five, and I don't need your permission to post about my reunion with my family on my Facebook page. Right. And because she and my 
birth father or third cousin. So I, I don't know if it, her, she still had a lot of shame and stuff, but I basically said, okay, I've, I'm done. I don't want contact with you anymore, leaving me and my wife alone. And a couple of weeks later, she called when we were in British Columbia visiting my grandma. And I just, I didn't pick up the phone and let go to voicemail. And after a couple hours, I just deleted the message. I didn't listen to it. Oh, you didn't even listen to it? Wow. No, I, I just, I didn't want that energy yeah. uh, when I was there visiting my grandma. She was in her mid-90s at the time, and uh, I, I just decided I, I don't need to engage with my birth mother. And it's been over, it's been a, about six years since that happened, and I, I've had no contact with her directly. Okay. What do you take away from that as to why she was so difficult and why the best thing to do was to break contact with her? Because when she would send me these letters or emails um, that were very angry or accusatory, it would really throw me for a loop for two or three days emotionally, Mm. or she would try to uh, reject me again. And I, I just decided, and it had been a long time coming, uh, but I just realized I'm not going to gain anything emotionally staying in contact with her anymore. Mm-hmm. And if I want to have peace and serenity in this, I can't control her, but I can control my environment and what I do uh, right. to engage with her or not. And it wasn't an easy decision, but I think it was the healthiest decision for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, when you said that that your your parents were cousins, were they first cousins? Um, my birth parents were third cousins. Oh, okay. Well, not, there's not a lot of shame in that, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's you know whatever somebody wants to think about it yeah. in whatever context. Yeah. But, um, that. I, I knew that from... Well, it's actually... The thing is, I mean, it's it's Canada, so there's a lot of... There's a lot of endogamy, especially on that side of the country, um, whether it be Acadian or just a French-Canadian. <clears throat> it's pretty common for people to be related and not know they're related, even. Yeah. 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 It, was that the case? Are they French-Canadian? No, 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 they're not. Oh, they're... okay. Irish and German oh, okay. <laughs> uh, heritage. All right. But still, I mean, I, there's, I, it, it's interesting that it seemed to bother her the most that the fact that she was somewhat related to your father was a, 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 a deal breaker. I, I, I don't know if it was that specifically, okay. but um, I mean, she used to be very open about uh, adoption uh, after I found her, she was on a local talk show oh, wow. and, and talked about it. She did a article in the local newspaper. Uh, Interesting. So, but uh, probably about 10 years ago, she, some, I don't know what happened specifically, but she started writing me and part of her letter would say, you know, I'm, I'm so over being, uh, I'm so over adoption. I don't want to be identified as a birth mother anymore. I okay. don't want to talk about the past. So when yet, yet she she uh, re- rejected therapy, right? So she was okay with controlling the narrative herself. If this is what mm-hmm. I'm hearing, <laughs> I'm, well, I'm going to be an uh, armchair therapist here. Um, so am I, do you think I'm on the right track though? Does it, it sounds like she, if she felt like she couldn't control the narrative that she didn't like it. I, I think so because I, I would, you know, if she brought, made, you know, kind of gaslit me and stuff, I would, I would hold her to task on yeah. 
I, I wouldn't just say, oh, that's just her being her. Um, because she she would make these false accusations. She would accuse me of lying about things or saying I didn't, didn't remember things that she said I did. But yeah. I, I have a very good memory. And, and I told her um, one, one time, I said, my wife doesn't have a good memory and we joke about it. But I will be as honest with you as I feel I can be um, because I don't, I don't like the lying and the, the BS that she would bring up or yeah. she would believe things that weren't true. I, I just finally got to the point where, you know, is, is this really worth continuing the relationship with her? Yeah, I totally get um, that. that. That totally makes sense to me. And I wonder if that's, because as as adoptees i think as adoptees where uh i don't know about you but i've always been um hyper vigilant and hyper intuitive uh, Mm -hmm. as well as having a very good memory as well i wonder if that's another thing that as adoptees we just are that way that's the way our brains work or that's the way we're conditioned or something um but i find that to be really interesting that yeah yeah that we have we have so much in common um just in how we ha- navigate these things i did I, I i've heard of a lot of biological mothers doing this um mine mm-hmm. did not well i mean we have our own issues but she certainly has never you know i've never felt like there was any narcissism or she was con- trying trying to control a narrative or anything um, okay but uh Really interesting. So when did you decide to to help other adoptees navigate reunion? Tell me about that. Uh, based on uh, about two years ago, I, I just realized, you know, I, I think my situation and my journey could help a lot of adoptees mm-hmm. um, navigate their own reunion. And that could be deciding whether to search or not, uh, when the search is going on, when you meet, and then post reunion. Because I, I notice on a lot of Facebook groups that I'm a part of that a lot of reunions just go sideways. Yep. And I think a lot of it is um, lack of communication, uh, expectations of each other that we may not be aware of yeah. um, what happens afterwards. Is there secrecy? You know, does the birth parent want the adoptee to be kept a dirty little secret? Mm-hmm. And, uh, just so many different moving parts. And I wanted to be able to do something to help adoptees with their own situations and reading journeys, as well as uh, birth parents and adopted parents, because we, they all have their own perspective mm-hmm. and experience in the, the adoption constellation. Right, right. And if you take all the relatives, grandparents, uh, cousins, siblings, aunts and uncles, adoption can affect, at least in the U.S., about six in ten people yeah. in this in the country. So that's almost 200 million people that directly or indirect directly are affected by adoption yeah and i i think it's it's important to help adoptees and and others involved and and try to have a smoother transition and integration with reunion into their lives um i don't believe that i i think it's sad that adoptive parents a lot of them don't entertain the idea that adoptees may want to search and have a right to search. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and they, I feel that too. And I think, I think society, um, that's the, that's kind of what society dictates and it mm-hmm. kind of goes to the whole ungrateful adoptee narrative that, uh, shouldn't be a thing, but seems mm-hmm. to be right. Yes, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's kind of, to me, uh, you know, if a, a man and woman get married, there's an expectation there's going to be 
uh, in-laws mm -hmm. and society in general usually has a space for that. Yeah. Birth parents uh, and adoptees that reunite, it doesn't, it's not there to replace the parents. It, it's there to add to their family so they can find out their story and find their truth. Exactly. And, and connect with people that look like them, think like them, talk like them, and act like them. Right. Right. That's a really good way to put it. It's, uh, it's not in the narrative. It's so hard for some people to... It's a very basic concept that two things mm -hmm. can be true. You know, yeah. you can love your adoptive family and appreciate your adoptive family and be grateful in all of that stuff. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't negate your desire, your, your actual human need to know more about yourself. Yes, yeah. that's true. That's yeah, true. that's how I feel about it too. So how can people get in contact with you if they, for your services? Um, I, I have a website, uh, adoptionreuniancoaching.com, and uh, people can email me, Darren, D-A-R-Y-N, at adoptionreuniancoaching.com, and I'm also on Facebook, and I have a blog on Facebook and Instagram called The Adoptee Mind. So if anybody wants to reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram or by email, uh, I do offer a free discovery call to talk about uh, what the situation is with the adoptee or anyone else involved in the adoption constellation. And then uh, I usually have coaching packages that I offer to to clients. And it's, it's not therapy. It's kind of moving forward at a, from your starting point now to where you want to be. Yeah as a sign of growth for yourself moving forward. Well, Darren, thank you, thank you so much for talking to me. I think uh, it, it was really important to, to, uh, to talk with you because I think this aspect of adoption reunion is so overlooked and I think it's such an important part um, of, as you said, the adoption constellation. So uh, I really appreciate you talking to me and giving us your insight and telling me and us, your experience. Um, I, I really appreciate you having me on your show and interviewing me. I think it's it's important that adoptees get help and resources and and be able to share their story. And uh, I'm really thankful you reached out to me. Okay, thank you so much, Darren, for that conversation. I thought it was really important to include uh, this content because... Um, in the media, what we see are the happy, shiny outcomes of every single adoption reunion. And it's uh, really a fallacy. It's not always that way. It is certainly sometimes. But I think it's important that everybody be as informed as possible on all sides of the triad and or the constellation, as Darren says. Thank you, Darren, so much. Hey, guys, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, we will see you in December for season five. In the meantime, have a good one, you guys. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. Drop me a line if need be. Uh, love talking to you guys. The truth is in your genes.